C, I was like, hey, I'm giving a talk at this Ohio Linux Fest about Puppet. And Luke Kniece, he was like, who are you? Like, I was like, I don't know, dude, but can you like check my slides, make sure I'm not lying? And he was like, wow, this is, this is pretty cool. And um, him and I are still friends, which is really great, because it, it was very interesting. At the time, I was just some guy who like, was really into Puppet. And all I did was like, say, you know, this saved me X amount of time. I should tell someone about this. So I did it at my lug, and then I did it at Ohio Linux Fest. And like, fast forward later, and now I'm doing this professionally, which is actually kind of scary. So if you're doing really cool stuff, you should like, submit and tell people things, because you will learn a lot of stuff, right? Like, the Kubernetes talk today was just excellent, right? Um, so that, that's, that's really awesome. Um, since I'm in Ohio, I really want to say that I'm really glad you guys won the national championship last year, and that's great and all, but this year, the Spartans are kind of gunning for you. Normally, we have a lot of things in common, right? We both hate the University of Michigan, um, which is fine, which is fine. I actually live in Ann Arbor, so it's like I'm a pilgrim, but a pilgrim in an unholy land, so... Hey, Michigan, we, we keep the Canadians at bay, so Ohio doesn't have to do it, right? And with their free, perfect health care and nice manners and stuff. Uh, okay. So, one day, I'm hanging out. So, I have a friend um, who works at a very, very large fruit company. Wink, wink. I can't say his name, so let's just call him Ken. Okay? And uh, he, he visits. He comes home every once in a while, and we're sitting around hanging out, beer. And when I was the system administrator at Oakland, he was like my student employee, right? You know, they pay him like not a lot of money. And I was like, man, remember all the stupid things we did that we thought were so awesome, like back then, doing Linuxy things. And he was like, oh God, did we really try to like do this NFS thing? And I was like, yeah, dude. Uh, so we sitting there and I was like, man, I actually like have to give a talk at Ohio Linux Fest. So what I should do is like, we should figure out all the stuff that we thought was really smart that people might be doing today and then I'll make a talk out of it. So. That's, 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 that's kind of like why I'm here. Like everything that I used to think was really awesome. Now if I look back, I was like, dude, that's totally wrong. And it was like, God, don't remind me. And then we started drinking more uh, to make the pain go away. So you're Linux users, you guys know um, all about alcoholism. Okay, so, right, like we had this system is really good. We had a bunch of users. We had thousands of computer science students finding every possible way to break things, right? We thought it was so cool and but like every piece of infrastructure, right? Like now that I look back at it, it's like, man, what kind of decaying hot mess like have I created in the world, right? And you know that this happens to people all the time, right? Like sometimes you might go and be like, hey man, I used to work for this company. Yeah, man, we had to, it was set up this way, and then like no one could figure it out, so we like redid everything. It happens all the time. It's really weird, right? Like, what if our actual infrastructure in America like worked that way? It would be insane if we had to like not maintain our roads. See, Ohio, you guys maintain your roads. Michigan, we just put the orange cones out, and then we don't fix anything, right? So I thought I knew it all. I thought I was, I thought I was a pretty decent, I wasn't like the world's greatest system administrator. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I knew that like automation was a thing. Um, so here I am with my real model, at my real IBM Model M, right? Like, I was like the living embodiment of 1990s Linux guy, right? Like, it took me like, months to figure out how to like copy music to that iPod in Linux back in the day. Remember how hard that was? Um, I had like Solaris machines, so like my, the backspace key never worked, and I thought, I don't know why I took this picture, I just thought it was really funny of, of, of why I would want to do this, right? I, lo I love this picture. It's like, we had this like idea of what our system would look like, right? And everything, and I, I thought it was so clever, right? It's like, well, all the Unix machines will be named after Saturn stuff, right? So the main thing and like every system that connects to that will be like a Saturnian moon. So the SSH to Tethys, I know exactly where I am. All the Windows machines will be named after Jupiter stuff, right? And like you come up with like this convoluted, <laughs> like, like you've, you've read this on Slashdot where a guy's like, actually mine are Firefly characters. <laughs> you know, and then you're like, well, I'll name stuff after comets that interact with both things and like, like, I had to SSH to a machine called Huygens. Do you know how horrible that is to like spell? Like, so they, like, but that was like how, right? It was like, this is my, this is, you come to Oakland University, this is my, you know, this is my network. It's a reflection of my personality. <laughs> Holy God. And then, um, right, and on top, I had to have like the history of the, this up there, that's the history of the Unix timeline. You guys have seen that thing, right? It's like, I had to know it. And, and this was like my little baby. This was my beautiful and unique snowflake. Um, so I thought, it, I thought it was pretty cool. I was actually running 
Linux, but on Sunrays, which like Sun really did not support. Uh, but we figured it out. It was awesome. Like um, we had to do very very naughty things with LP preload. You guys know all about that. Uh, network printers. I I was suffering with cups way more and longer than most people. Right. I had something like 325 printers at one point. Now it's like the future. I'm like, why do we have paper? Like, I don't get it. But they're still there. I asked because I was like, man, I really want one of the old used HP cubes, right? Those things are awesome. And they kind of don't make them like that anymore, which is sad. But that's one of them right there. It's like my favorite one. It's got the, it's got, it's got two trays. All right, sorry. Um, right, I had triple head because I was totally like doing the matrix thing. And that was like way harder back then. Like, if you're struggling with, like, NVIDIA, you think you're struggling with NVIDIA drivers today, boy. Woo! Man. Yeah, and I got the cool, like, I figured out that, like, if I just tailed all the syslogs and ran them through a log colorizer, like, when a professor would come by, it would look like I was doing stuff. But I was, like, really just, like, posting on Slashdot or whatever. And I, yeah, so. There's a lot of things I've learned from now until then that I was, I was, like, the more we talked about it, the more I was like, man, that's really, really horrible. So that's where I came up with this idea. What if I go back, teach myself things, and then use that to, like, apply for myself today, right? So if I can kind of convince myself to be more open-minded back then, back then, that means today when the latest hot new sexy thing comes out, I don't get all stodgy and like, that will never work in production, because I hate being that guy. Um, so we're going to build a time machine. This is an interactive keynote, right? So... Um, this is one of my favorite movies, The Time Machine. It's based on a book. That's when people write words and then buy them. Um, but most people, uh, so I really liked this movie growing up, but most people think of this. This is like way cooler. This is the, this is the cool time machine. So we're going to build a time machine. And then, disclaimer before we proceed, because this can get dangerous, right? Automatic at the trackies are like, well, actually, dude, you can't mess with the time loop. So what I want to do is we don't want to totally mess things up. So we're going to go back in time and convince ourselves of general concepts, right? It's not going to be like, always bet on the Patriots because you know they're cheating, right? That's like not fair. You can't do that. So also, generally speaking, everything I'm talking to you today is like kind of meant for generalized software guys like us. If you make software that like keeps planes in the sky or pacemakers and stuff, do not listen to anything I'm saying. In fact, you guys keep going. I don't need like my insulin pump to like not work because you decided to like run a pre-release version of Kubernetes because you went to Ohio Linux Fest and listened to George Castro. So, and there are, there are way, way, way smarter people than me on this. So I challenge you to go find the truth is out there. Because um, there's rules to these sorts of things, right? You can't just change things. So, and I wanted to keep the talk interesting. You can't just go back and be like, containers are a thing, right? That's like, that's just not fun. Um, so ideally, we go back in time, we come back, and my server room looks like a lot like this, right? Like, that's what's going to happen to me, right? If we mess up, we come back and there's Nazis riding dinosaurs and all this kind of like craziness, right? Um, but, but what actually will happen is what I'm really afraid of. So how many of you guys like Star Trek? Next generation? All right, awesome. So there's this great episode. You should go watch it tonight when you get home on Netflix. Hard by Ubuntu. Bing. Um, and the name of the episode is called Tapestry. It's one of my favorite episodes. How many of you are familiar with this episode? This is like the greatest Star Trek episode ever. So Picard is kind of in the same situation I am right now, right, going back in time. He's like, if only I would have done these things different. And I could have, you know, been more responsible and things like that. Bad things would happen, right? And so Q, who's an omnipotent being, says, okay, fine. And Picard's like, well, I can't do that. I can't mess with the timeline, right? So he says, fine, Everything, every decision you make will only affect you, right? So he gives him his wish, he comes back in time, and Picard's a totally different person. He's a lieutenant, junior grade, right? And he's like, what happened to me? I'm a man, breath of passion. And he's like, doesn't run the Enterprise. Like, everyone's like, you're kind of, a, you're kind of not an awesome Starfleet officer. And he was like, that's what happened. And Q was like, I gave you exactly what you wanted. You wanted to be more responsible and do all these things. So you also didn't take any risks, right? That's why you're this boring, really horrible, boring person, right? And Picard said, this man is bereft of passion, right? I would rather die than be that man and live that life cue. Um, so we're going to proceed in this way, and we're kind of, kind of just let it rip. Um, I just realized I totally spoiled the episode for those of you that haven't seen it. But hey, it's your fault, man. That thing's been out since like 1993. It's not my fault. You 
go to a Linux class and you don't get a Star Trek joke. Come on, man. This is dang. Um, so I got a video here. Hold on. This will be awesome. I promise. So, all right, we're getting in our time machine and we're traveling through time. Uh, astute observers will actually say that we're actually going through a wormhole because this is Stargate. I have Stargate jokes also. Also one of my favorite shows. So we're going back in time now, and the year is now 2002-ish, let's say. Yeah? Okay. So we go. Don't worry, there won't be ghouls or anything. All right. So, all right, so we're here. A lot of things are the same. We still have Linux. We don't want to go too back far in time because then we have to deal with Solaris, and I never want to go through that again, right? Um, I'm still a system administrator, so the, the, the quality of service is, is still a thing. Um, I still always wear a Metallica shirt, jeans, always a ThinkPad. That hasn't changed. Hey! Um, they tried, and then it was horrible. Um, and no Nazis, so we're good, right? We haven't messed with the time, the time continuing. What's different, though? My understanding of complexity is different, especially looking at systems, right? And back then, we were on the verge of commodity, right? Like, AWS was just starting to come out, and like, a lot of people didn't get it, right? They're like, it's just like a Linode with an API. What's the big deal? Hmm. Right? And I was really good at machine level problem solving, right? This machine is busted SSH. Blam! -o. Okay, figure it out. Fix my puppet thing so it's like fixed forever. And I'm doing everything all manually and stuff. And I kind of had that 1990s Linux attitude, right? Where it was like, my stuff is really awesome. My uptime, like you find yourself posting on the internet. It's like, oh yeah? 372 days, guy. Awesome. That means I haven't applied security patches in years, right? Um, so I had this attitude that my beautiful, unique snowflake system is a handcrafted masterpiece of art. And here's, oh, here's another disclaimer as well. Because I'm going in back in time and preaching to myself. I can't, that way, like, I, I can't offend you because I'm not really preaching to you. I'm preaching to myself. So it's more of a narcissistic thing than a, than a thing. So I'm going to start to preach to myself a lot. Um, and hopefully I'm preaching to the choir, because I had a lot of people check these slides, and they're like, preach it, brother. So um, you might not agree with some of the things I say. So everything that's in orange is what 1990s George is going to say, and then everything in purple, when you see the slide, that's what I believe today. And then I'm going to like convince you that I'm right, I think. Unless I'm not, and that's fine, too. Um, so you guys have heard this before. How many have not heard the term pets versus cattle before? How many of you are, okay, let me back up. How many of you are using Linux professionally, like as a sysadmin or stuff? Raise your hands, keep them up, keep them up. How many of you are doing that on the cloud? Whoa, holy smokes, okay. Um, all right, put your hands down. How many of you are not using Linux professionally or you're just here a hobbyist, you just think it's cool? Okay, that's really cool. All right, um, how many of your students, anyone here from like OSU, computer science club and stuff? Welcome, I totally get you. Back. Back when I was like your age, I used to go to these shows and there'd be like an old dude up here telling me how I would do stuff. And I remember, I remember his name was Chris DeBona, which is, which is kind of funny. And he was like, hey, when you guys get out there in the world, these are the technologies you should know. And he was like, anyone would guess what the technology was? Uh, a long time ago, let's just say that. I don't know, early 2000s. AS400. AS, really? Is that what you're going to do? No, no. He, he, LAMP was the thing back then, right? They were like, if you're in college and you learn LAMP, you will make a lot of money when you get out of college, right? Um, so I've got that slide for you guys at the end. I'm going to show you how you're going to like kick ass as the new future Linux guys. And then you get to submit talks. And I'll be like, you're totally wrong, kid. Um, so this is the pets versus cattle. Like, you hear this a lot in DevOps talks. And what, what is it, right? It's... The general gist is like, I was used to having machines that were beautiful, unique snowflakes, right? They had cool names like Tethys and Linus and, right? I do this at home, right? Like my, my servers are named after my wife, right? So I have Jelly Bean, Jalociraptor, right? I'm attached to these things, right? Like they, I give them names, so like when I break them, it like hurts me as a person. It's like getting, getting my, my dog getting kicked. Um, but, Today, if you look at the way people are doing ops, it's totally opposite. And you would think it's totally opposite of what you're used to reading in like your Unix book. Um, one of my first ones, John Maddow calls Linux book. Um, and I was like, wait, this is right? Until you start to hang out with people who are doing this at scale, right? Like when you talk to somebody at Netflix, they're like, we don't even know like where some stuff runs. It's in a container somewhere and it's got this weird ID. 
Like they don't really care. They're thinking more about the service itself. So when you when your machines that are giving you your services now are, are instances and they are repeatable and they're disposable and you don't care about them more, they're kind of more like cattle, right? right? This, one's, this one's not really working right. That's a systemic issue. Bam, you kill it, right? And it's delicious. It's, it's really good. So it's, repeat, I feel that repeatability is a new uptime, right? Because you have to do security patches and you have to do things like that. So the, your, your ability to ensure that a complex system comes up every single time the exact same way it's supposed to. Um, I believe this is the new metric of I'm a good sysadmin uh, these days. And it goes beyond automating everything. Because it's not just automating a server, right? Remember when you, when you used to get a server, you got this brand new HP per line, you're like, oh man, there it is, oh, is that the new G3? Sweet, right? And, like, and you would do it and you'd like, okay, this machine is going to be a web server. Therefore, Puppet, you need to do ABC, blah, 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 blah. Right? So you started from the bottom up, right? Now, we strongly believe, and I mean like in, in the Ubuntu kind of cloud world, that everything is kind of more top down, right? You're kind of thinking about the service first instead of the machine. Um, that's why when you look at something like Kubernetes or Apache Mesos or something, that makes a lot more sense to you when you start to think of it that way. Um, so it's not just a server, it's the applications as well. And applications today are written totally different from what they were. Um, a while ago, when things like horizontal scalability like didn't exist, um, so people are solving these problems, and we should steal their ideas. And I feel that part of my primary job is ensuring that those cool ideas that people are doing is delivered to you in a regular basis in consumable chunks that you don't have to be a genius to understand, right? And it kind of, you know, it, it kind of gets to that our microservices. I mean, they might, they might not be. We certainly weren't doing any microservice-based stuff. Um, in any of the applications I was deploying. But that's like a question you should have. Uh, so your real actual infrastructure won't look anything like that, that Unix book. Like every time I hang out with someone from Google, there's a guy who's working on Kubernetes, he's like, oh, it's so good to be, to be in an open source thing that we made at Google again because you know, we all learned, we all grew up on kind of a lamp stack, right? And then you get hired by Google and you're using all these weird things that don't match what anyone else is doing. I was like, so I, I, found, I found that comment really interesting. Um, so yeah, definitely learn the LAMP stuff, but get through that chapter as fast as possible because there's like awesomer stuff and more complex stuff that you guys are going to figure out while I retire. Um, this, is, this is another one. Um, this is the whole DevOps. Here comes the DevOps part. Uh, is like when you were a sysadmin and then there were developers, right? And they were actually physically on separate floors, which now seems very crazy to me. And they would, they would deliver their application to you, and then it was your job to make sure it ran well, right? Then, of course, what happens, right? It's like a student in a stupid little Visual Basic script. And then you go and you copy it onto the web server, and it doesn't work because he hard-coded local hosts in there, right? That, like, that's fundamentally what DevOps is supposed to solve. Okay, really, it's a lot more complicated than that. But fundamentally, right, what a developer thinks the world looks like and what a sysadmin thinks the world looks like can, uh, can be different things. You might actually be the same person, which is really strange. Um, so a few years ago, I don't know, you know actually more like five years ago, we kind of restructured to be more of a DevOps organization. Um, and it was kind of painful because it's not really a technology problem. It's like a human teamwork problem, right? So we do this weird thing where like on our team we have ops guys and they rotate in and out. And when the app breaks, it's everyone's responsibility to fix it, not just a developer guy who throws code over the wall, or the sysadmin guy, right? Um, and this, this is a, a very, I think it's really cool because when you look at job postings now for like what people want in a system administrator, right? They kind of expect you to know the platforms that you're deploying, right? So if you're in a rail shop, you kind of expected to kind of know how to debug that stuff, right? And then your developers are kind of expected to kind of have a stake in how operations work because they're the ones that write the application. So everybody talks about this, right? And every time I, I read a DevOps book or I see someone giving a talk, it's like, this is really advanced common sense. Um, but it's hard because it's a human thing and humans are, in, are fallible people. Uh, so it's something that you really struggle with all the time. And you have to have the discipline as an organization to make that work. So I'll give you an example because everyone always thinks it's the sysadmin guys who aren't the the leading, right? It's like developers have to drag sysadmins into the cloud so they can get cool stuff, right? So I'm working with a, 
with a guy. I don't want to call him out, but his name is Michael Hall. <laughs> and he was like, man, I really, really hate doing Mojo specs. So in Canonical, we open source all of our infrastructure. So all of our Juju charms. And we have the CI tool called uh, Mojo, which actually deploys all of our services in production, right? And every developer who wants to run something in our production open stack um, has to write a Mojo spec, which basically describes how the services, you know, all this, all this kind of like really complicated stuff. He was like, man, I really wish I could just give IS my code for my Django project and then just get out of there, right? And everybody wants it to be that way, right? But it takes a lot of discipline to be like, no, you can't do it that way because we do it this way. And it kind of forces you in a certain workflow. And sometimes people don't like that. But it takes someone looking from the top down to say, you know what? If we all did this as an organization, it stops things like siloing. It helps you share best practices, right? All the good things that really awesome ops companies do, right? When you kind of have that discipline, you get all those benefits. So it's really tough. Um, but you should do it. It's, it's pretty awesome. There are a lot of resources on how to run a lean DevOpsy <laughs> stuff. So that's some homework if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Um, I used to love spending time to ensure each server is up and running, right? It was like the most embarrassing thing if a server ever went down. It's like, man, I'm a Linux guy. I'm like, no, the Windows guy's going to make fun of me. Like, what's happening? Oh, but they got to deal with Exchange. Ha ha. You know? um, so, like, it was, it, was like a, it was like a big deal, right? Like, it was like, okay, you know, I've got, like, the pager thing set up. So, like, you know, I, I'm a month in advance if I'm ever going to run out of this or whatever, right? Because this is my work core, baby. This is, like... Tune to my specifications. I don't want some designer from who designed the ship to tell me how to run my own work core. I'm out here in the field. I'm out here where, like, you know, the metal meets the ground. This is like what I want to do. Um, so an example would be like, hey, we have this production application and the database went away, right? The database should never go away because the application doesn't know what to do if it can't connect to the database, right? So 1990s George is thinking, that is horrible. Well, how do we do things back then? Right? We scaled up. Right? It's like, I know what we need. We need more reliable hardware. I should totally spend $250,000 on that Sun server. Right? Um, redundant power supplies and stuff. It never occurred to me back then that if an application can't connect to the database and it doesn't like handle that, that, that might be the application's fault. Right? Because why? We, we were used to doing the monolithic thing. Right? It was like the Unix way. Right? This database server will never will never go down. It never occurred to us, right, that we could just throw a bunch of really cheap x86 servers at something, right, and the application could be designed for failure, right, but the cloud forces you to design things that way. That's why, generally speaking, they're more reliable and cheaper. That's why companies like us exist now. Um, because as it ends up, this is totally antithetical to everything I learned, is host reliability doesn't matter. Individual machines will always break. Right? If you get, if the bigger your data center gets and stuff, all those hard drives, right, eventually they will fail, right? And who, who, like, I remember seeing my first talk when, like, I read, I heard that, like, there's Google people who just walk down aisles, remove drives, and slap it in, and the software does everything magically, right? And that's, that was totally, like, learning, learning your mind to switch that kind of mentality was, um, was really difficult for me. It's the service uptime that matters. Right? How many, did any of you guys attend the Kubernetes talk today? Is that guy here? Where is he? Is he not here? Oh, okay, he didn't come to my talk. I went to his, I get it. That's cool. <laughs> right, but they do like a rolling upgrade where like, hey, I do an upgrade, I'll take some containers down, some up, a load balance, smart load balancer does all the things. It's designed for hosts to just go away, right? Um, and I really feel that applications that are not conducive to this kind of horizontal scaling, like really don't fit well in the cloud in the, cloud, in the cloud world, right? It looks a lot, like a cloud database looks a lot more like Cassandra and something horizontally scalable than the other proprietary monolithic vertical one that they charge you a lot of money. I don't want to call anyone out. It starts with an O. Um, so, and everything will fail eventually, right? Because it's hardware, right? Like when you hear someone say, you know, we used to use redundant power supplies. Now we don't because now if the node dies, we just don't care. Right? And then we saved a lot of power and money on not buying power supplies, and we just bought more servers, right? Uh, that, that's, like, that's like really weird, and what do you mean? But the Sunfire is like, totally, all right, whatever. Um, and you've got to embrace the Chaos Monkey. How many of you have not heard of Chaos Monkey? Have 
time. Okay, so when I heard about this, I thought this blew my mind, right? So Netflix, they kind of know a few things about, about ops. And they're like, we actually have this suite of programs called the Chaos Monkey was the first one. And what it does is it goes through our production infrastructure and it just blows stuff up. I was like, so wait a minute. I'm sitting here spending all my time trying to keep things reliable. You guys are writing software that goes and disconnects switches, right? Fills up disks. Like, and they're not just practicing on their laptops kind of fun. They're like in product. What? What are you doing? That's crazy, right? But they're really, really, really good at it now, right? And it makes their service like a lot more reliable, right? So we have one of these internally at our work, and I think you should too, right? What happens when that switch turns off? I don't know. We never tested it, right? The disaster recovery guys in the back are like, I've been saying this for 15? Yeah, I get it, I get it. Um, you know, but like, to actually purposely introduce this stuff, that's crazy. They got different ones now. They got like security monkey that like opens random port. Like, what, what are you guys doing? Like, it's crazy. Um, but they embraced it, right? And they're really, really good at it now, right? That's why that service is very reliable now compared to some of the other services um, that do that. Why? Because ops is a competitive advantage, isn't it? Right? If you as a system administrator can get your developers to save five, ten minutes here or there, right, your entire organization becomes really efficient. And when we're talking at the scale of like a very large percentage of North American traffic running through Netflix, you understand why. Right? Because when an old school media company launches their new streaming service, it falls over, doesn't it? Look at you, Sling TV. Um, and you want to practice this every day. Like you have to, uh, and there goes the discipline again, because let's face it, being a board is way more efficient than being like the enterprise, right? Like that whole free will thing, don't worry about it. Um, but you know, a whole bunch of something that's generic and reusable is a lot more usable and easier to debug and a lot more observable, right, than your beautiful, unique snowflake, right? And we, see, we still see this, it like saddens me. I was talking to an organization, they were very large, very competent, and they were like, well, we finally figured out how to do OpenStack. It took me, it took us three months, and we finally got it all set up, and I know your way makes it so like OpenStack deploys in 11 minutes, and it does. Um, but I don't really like, that was like three months, I'm kind of attached to it now, and I was like, ah, or, or, or like I was sticking in my head, I was like, are we becoming so emotionally attached to our scripts that it, like, I always try to think, I'm trying to remove code and complexity from my systems, right? Um, so don't get too attached. Pets first cow. Um, and I would have this thing where it was like, it takes time to deploy things right. Why is the hurry? Why is everyone in a hurry? Why is everyone speed, speed, speed? Docker so fast, speed, 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 right? Um, I would do two major deployments a year, right? Because it was a university. It was, it was like a few weeks before the student came, came, uh, came to campus, right? And I was like, that was my time to fix bugs in production, right? And that's, that's the way it was. Um, but when things are reproducible, it's like really smooth to get things up and running. And smooth is fast, right? If like, there are no errors, if you hit enter or whatever it is, or your git commit, whatever it is that triggers your magic, right? If that's all nice and automated, you literally just sit there and wait for it to return. Um, that's really fast, that's smooth. And then that becomes fast, right? So deployment should be routine. That's something that we didn't do at all. Um, and now that I talk to people, like, it's crazy when you hear people deploying their, their apps at major big services, like, multiple times a day, right? Like, you guys have read Facebook's blogs, and you're like, well, man, that's crazy. That's awesome. And that exercises your DevOps workflow I was talking about before, right? And you get really, really good at that. Because um, you don't want to learn this at 2 a.m. We've all been there. It's like, man, why did I, why did I have to use NFS? It's always, NFS is always involved. You ever notice that? Like, it's always... <laughs> You know, and I was like, oh, why did I have to do that? Why, why are there lock files here? Like, I should, should I remove those? I don't know. What, too late? No. Oh. Um, you know, and there was, there was a lot of very humanish things happening here, right? Like, if you just let go and embrace the automation, it's like, you know, you're going to make a web service that will just automatically generate your Docker containers. Then you don't have to worry about this whole container soup you're putting yourself in, right? And speed is the bonus that you get out of all of this, right? Like people trying to say, yeah, I want to, make, I want to speed everything up, blah, blah, blah. But speed is the bonus, and speed makes your users happy because they can be more productive. And that's, generally speaking, where you want to be. Um, so just get used to going to 88 miles an hour all the time. Then it's not a problem to hit 88 miles an hour. You don't have to like, do all the crazy things that you need to do to get to 88 miles an hour. Right? Um, 
One of my favorites, students would be like, I need root access to my web server. I'm 18 years old and I just learned PHP. It's like, okay. Um, so we, we would, I would, you know what, kid? Get yourself your operating system, give me your code, and then get out of my face and I will, I will handle this. Um, so like, now, hopefully everyone gets this by now and I know